Hey everyone, today I want to talk about a topic that I don't really hear a lot about. And the topic is purification. Even maybe purification versus forgiveness and what's the difference. I've never really even put any thought into this until yesterday. I woke up yesterday and I heard the Lord, you know, Leviticus 12. And so I'm like, okay. So I went and read Leviticus 12 and it's about... Um, you know, like what a, what a woman is supposed to do after she gives birth to a child. And there is this period of cleansing, cleansing or a period of purification. And I kind of was like, I don't know what you're trying to do here, Lord. And so I started to get into the word searches of the Hebrew. And I realized that, that what... The sacrifices were under the law were the same sacrifices that were for sin. And I'm like, this doesn't even make sense because she didn't sin. <laughs> and then it was, then I, this morning, it, I was like, oh my gosh, it was the sins that were done to her. She didn't commit these sins. It was just something that was done to her. And so she had a process of purification. And that's something that, that I think a lot of us don't understand or experience is that process of purification. And we tend to focus, and the church focuses so much on your sin and what you, what do you do with your sin. And Jesus forgave your sin. But we don't talk a lot about the sin that was done to us. Because I fully believe, and I, I think everyone would agree, that these sins that were done to us, that they actually shape us and they mold us into a character that is unlike who God created us to be. Not to mention that they shape us and mold us into a character that's not like Christ. <laughs> and I, I, we were talking about this last night at our men's group, and it's about children and about how each child has different wounds and how we handle discipline and how we handle whatever when it comes to each child differently because each child has, a, has different wounds. And each person has different wounds. And God is so personal that he cares about those. And just as he can reach every single person differently, you know, he can also use us to speak to people differently to get the healing that they need. And I've said this in many of my videos, but in Isaiah 61, you know, Jesus comes to he, to mend the brokenhearted or to put together that shattered soul because in our soul, we have all these hurts and these wounds or these sins that were done to us and they begin to conform us into the image of who we're not. And it's like, if I don't have an understanding of who I am, like truly who I am, then I'm going to begin to allow other people to make that decision for me. And even more so, when I understand who I am in Christ, my identity in Christ, you know, that will greatly... Like I'm, I'm renewing my mind. I'm, I'm re living in repentance. I'm changing my mind about really who I am. I'm not what these other people have said about me. I'm not what these other people have done to me. Nor am I what I have done. Who I am is what God says about me: holy, blameless, and above reproach. I mean, the justified. But the one that I'm talking about today is I'm purified. I'm purified. That, that, that purification, you know, like we have the forgiveness of sin, but then we have the purification of sin. So that, that purification, I believe, more so, it, it actually, that's the whole cleansing of our conscience. Because if someone keeps hurting me, or if I've been holding on to these wounds from something horrendous that was done to me as a child or as a teenager or an adult, it doesn't matter. I, I take that pain in, but yet Jesus says, I'm here to purify you of what was done to you. And that's the power of the blood. It not only forgives us, it purifies us. All things are created brand new. All things have passed away. And, okay. Jesus took the sin of the world. This may help. Maybe to put, a picture on where 
the sins are that were done to you. Sure, they're in your mind, they're in your soul, but really, where are they? Jesus took the sin of the world. And I remember asking the Lord a long time ago, like, well, where did he take it? <laughs> and people would be like, well, the sins are as far as east is to the west. Okay, well, that's great, it's quoting scripture, but I need a place. Like, where did my sins go? Are they just vanished in the atmosphere? Maybe. Um, but because of the way that my brain works, and God helps me with that. In Ephesians 4, we read that Jesus descends to the center of the earth. And reading Peter, that the first place he goes to, according to Peter, is he goes and he um, declares to the spirits that were formerly disobedient during the days of Noah. And I think he was like, hey, you guys lost. <laughs> um, I won. And then he goes and he gets those people. In chapter 4, he goes and he preaches to the dead so that, so that they could hear as if in the flesh. And so here he's in the center of the earth. And then we see him standing next to the tomb. Mary's there. She doesn't recognize him. She, she thinks he's a gardener. And then when she finally recognizes him, could you imagine like being Mary and being like, once you get it, what you would want to just lunge and hug him and wrap your arms around him. And he said, don't touch me for I have yet ascended to the father. Well, why is that important? Well, it's important because no sin, this is the whole purpose of the, of when they would take the, the a priest would go behind that veil. Well, if he had sin, they tied a rope and a bell on him. If he had sin, he would drop dead in the presence of God when he went past the veil. Well, Jesus was about ready to go past the veil. He surely couldn't do it with sin on him because the sin of the world was placed on him. Well, at this time, when he was going to ascend to the Father, he clearly didn't have that sin. And that's why I believe that he didn't want Mary to touch him because he couldn't be defiled with flesh because no flesh or blood can enter heaven. I mean, we put off all kinds of stuff. I mean, it, sh dead cells, whatever. I, I don't, I don't, I don't know the science behind it, but I do know that Jesus says, "Don't touch me." I've yet ascended to the Father, and then we read, you know, eight days later, where he says to Thomas, he's like, "No, uh, touch me, touch me." So he says to to Mary, "Don't touch me." I've yet ascended to the Father. Eight days later, he says, "No, touch me." So between that period of time frame is when we read in Hebrews where he says he took his blood to the most holy place not made by human hands so he took that he makes that offering for all mankind that once and once and forever offering of all mankind so where's our sin I believe he left it in the center of the earth and and if you think about it the center would be as far as east is to the west um I mean, because you got a globe, well, east and west, and then the center is as far as east is to the west. So, I don't know, that's my theory. But in my mind, it helps me to understand that, that like it says in 1 John 2, 2, that he's the propitiation not only for my sins, but for the sin of the whole world. And if you study that word propiti propitiation, you'll find it a few times. Basically, well, not basically, a propitiation means to appease and pacify the, the offended party. This is that covenant of peace that was promised so that God can have peace with everyone. And even those who don't believe, this is why Jesus says, even those who do not believe, I do not judge, but they will be judged in the end day because he didn't come to condemn the world, but he came to save the world. And without this propitiation, this part of atonement on me, I can't even go before the Father to receive salvation because I could never get there because I had sinned. So therefore, and they're probably thinking, oh, this guy's a heretic. I don't really care because I know that this is true. I know it's true. And the Bible backs it up. But Jesus took the sin of the world. And I'm not saying everyone's going to enter the kingdom of God. That's I'm not saying that at all. But what's really interesting is I also believe that because, because this propitiation is part of grace and it's a free gift, they can't earn it. So grace is something that we can't earn and the whole entire world has grace. People are like, well, no, -uh. no, you have to believe. Well, no, because Paul says that we've been given the ministry of reconciliation 
And then a few verses later in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, so that they don't take the grace of God in vain. Well, you can't take something in vain if you don't already have it. Grace isn't what saves us. It's faith through grace. Or is it grace through faith? Whatever. But it's the combination of faith and grace of how we enter the kingdom of God. However, everyone has this grace. Everyone has this propitiation. Every, it has a, everyone has this atonement that has appeased and pacified the offended party or the wrath of God. Um, if you want to get technical, you know, I think that when you add the faith in with the grace, that's called the expiation of sin. So we have the expiation of sin. Um, but whatever. But when we understand that, that even these sins that were done to us, that Jesus even took those, now the scriptures begin to make sense when Paul says in Colossians and in Ephesians, he says, forgive as you've been forgiven. And it's like, oh my gosh, well, I was forgiven even before I asked it for it. I mean, Jesus took my sin even before I asked for it because it's true. Jesus took my sin 2,000 years ago. My sin was in him. And just as my sin was in him 2,000 years ago, before I could repent, before I could ask for forgiveness, well, then it had to have been this other person's sin as well that was done to me. And then we can begin to wrap our mind around, wow, I'm, I, do, I can forgive that person because Jesus can forgive as you've been forgiven because and all of many of us have said, well, I've forgiven that person. But yet we have a negative emotion attached to that when we hear that person's name. We're not free of what they've done to us. The girls just got home. I can hear them down there. Um, oh, I kind of went off on a rambling thing there, but hold on a second. What's up, honey? Are you okay with them? I have the best girls. It's my birthday today, and they made me some stuff. That's cool. Uh, so, anyhow, I really want to read that. But they got me, I'll wait. But when we understand the process of purification, and that process is like in our mind to wrap our head around that I am purified. That's that whole, my conscience is cleansed. And because in our conscience is where we hold all these sins that were done to us so that conform us into the image which isn't like him. And this is the plan of the enemy. You know, it's to con be conformed into his, into the image of God, into the image of Christ. And when I can let go and realize that Jesus not only forgave me, that he purified me, this is why the sins that were done against me no longer can tell me who I am. And I can truly begin to forgive people and truly like, begin to love people. I've said this many times, but it's like when we're free of people, like free of the offenses that have been done to us, we can really be free to love them. And this is why Jesus was our example because Jesus was free of us. Jesus didn't need Barabbas. Jesus didn't need the Jews to agree with him. His love, he was going to die for Barabbas just as much as he was going to die for Peter. That sacrifice was the same, whether they believed who, who he was or didn't. He was free of us, so he could love us. And when we're free of the sins that were done to us and we can really wrap our mind around this purification. It will radically change your life. It will change your behavior. It will change the way that you react when you feel offended. You may even become less offended because um, like Jesus, you can't offend a dead man. You know, when we're dead, buried, crucified in Christ. You can't, I don't think you can offend God. I really don't. I really don't. I think he's pretty secure in who he is 
and when we become secure in who he is, it will, I mean, just imagine being free of these horrible things that were done to you. You know, people, I can never forgive them. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, he says, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And it's like, well, how can Jesus say that? How can Jesus say, forgive them, for they know not what they do? They knew what they were doing. But they didn't know the consequences that it would have in the future. They didn't really know what they were doing. And so these sins that were done to us, these people didn't know what they were doing because they didn't know the consequences that it would have on you 5, 10, 20, 50 years later. You know, and this is why we can say the same thing, forgive them, because they really didn't know what they were doing, you know. And the truth is, is most people act out and they sin against you in a way because they it was once done to them. And then we can even be even more compassionate towards them because instead of thinking of yourself and thinking about what was done to you, it was actually done to them, maybe even worse. And then we can actually have this compassion that God has, that Christ had for us, and that we can be healed and that we can begin to truly forgive because there's so much power in forgiveness. But when we can really wrap our mind around this purification, that you're forgiven and you're also purified of the sins that were done to you. That these have, they have cleansed your conscience. That, that we need to, just as we need to receive the forgiveness of sin, I need to receive that I'm purified. I need to receive that my conscience is cleansed. It's all a free gift. We just need to receive it. So I hope after this video, I hope I've done, I hope I've explained it um, in a way that you can wrap your mind around it because it is something really hard to explain and um, check my notes make sure I got everything purification versus forgiveness um, okay last thing I know for myself um, a lot of the character traits that I had like especially anger um, and other things that I know that through my walk with the Lord that he's shown me that I actually have to have these traits because of what was done to me. So I had put up walls. Well, there are such things as healthy walls and there's such thing as really bad walls. And when we put up walls to keep people out, those are really unhealthy walls because Jesus never put that wall up to keep anybody out. Um, you know, maybe there's a wall, but there's a gate. <laughs> he needs the gate. Uh, he gives a way in. And anyways, and so it's like these sins that were done to me, uh, they, they shaped me and they formed me in a pattern that actually caused me to walk off of the, the path. You know, but it's like when I can forgive these people... I can get back on that path. And then when I realize that I'm purified, I mean, that's just like, I'm, I'm now free. That yoke is easy. His burden is light. Like that scripture becomes life to me. It becomes true. It becomes a living testimony in me. Yeah. And I think that I'm, I'm not going to take you through this prayer or process or whatever. I'm just going to let the Lord work in your heart. But I hope that this video helps you to grasp the concept of that the process that you're purified. You're forgiven and you're purified. You know, you're purified from that what was done to you. All right, love you guys. Blessings.